I want to offer a few uh, reflections on this teaching from Nisargadha and then open it up. My first point is that it's easy to relate to this stuff as, oh, airy fairy, nothing, everything, what? You know, guys from India, I, you know, India is cool, but like, whoa, that's just way esoteric or something. You know, we can have that kind of reaction to it. And the point of so many of these teachings, including the, the most profound teachings, is in a way they're the most intimate. They're actually about the immediacy right here in the, in the landing of this moment of what it's like to be me, whoever me is, right? Uh, whoever you are, um, you know, what's, what's, what's it like, right? What's the case? And what Nisargadha is pointing to is certainly also what the Buddha really pointed to, um, which is these two together. You can use different words for them. Nothingness, everythingness. Emptiness, fullness. Letting go, letting in. This way in which our experience of the moment, when we really come into the moment, and we let go of attachments and we let go of distractions and we let go of these sort of things we cling to to help us, you know, glue us together. Uh, when we come right into the moment, we start to really notice there, there are these two remarkable qualities of our existence experientially, the sense of things disappearing and arriving together continuously. And the great teachers point out this fact because it's true and also because the recognition of this and the growing comfort with the fact of disappearingness and arrivingness, emptiness and fullness actually brings a profound profound wisdom and peace and well-being. We become more at ease with the reality of life, the letting go, uh, which helps us let go in other kinds of ways, to let go of our righteous position, you know, in a tussle with another person, uh, to let go uh, of just things change, right? Children leave home. Uh, rust never sleeps. <laughs> Eventually, this body itself uh, will decay and pass away. Um, so as we become more present with and okay with just the endless endings of all experiences, uh, we become uh, more at ease with the larger scale surrenderings and releasings uh, in this life, including just literally relaxing as we exhale or just disengaging from worries and preoccupations of various kinds, or disengaging from desires that take us into trouble, just letting it go, right? While at the same time, wow, wow. As we open up to this sense, as Nisargadha writes, of being everything through love, it brings us into a sense of love and it can almost be ecstatic. You can almost get sort of <laughs> a gape when you just relax and, and open to the receivingness of the next moment. It brings us into thankfulness. It helps us appreciate our interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh puts it, with everything, as we have a sense of um, the everythingness, you know, the ways in which we're lived by everything. The two together. Deep, 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 deep teachings. And in my own experience, this sense of both in our experience, this is about our experience. The sense of both in our experience actually gives us a way to meet the challenges of the present time. In other words, there can be understandably a sense of being buffeted by vast forces, historical forces, economic forces, people with enormous economic and or political power who do various things. You know, yeah, like, can't do anything at all. And there's a comfort 
in realizing, well, yeah, both things are true. Uh, we are awash in everything and um, any individual wave in the ocean doesn't seem to matter that much. And yet also we can recognize and feel the ways in which um, the actions that we take, the votes broadly, the words, the deeds, the thoughts, the choices, the commitments that we make, the process of this can make an enormous difference in um, how we live and how we affect other people. Much as we are the living of so many waves, so many actions, so many ripples set in motion by others, when you start to realize, wow, that, it's a two-way street. Those others are also the result of so many waves, so many actions, so many choices, so many thoughts, so many intentions flowing out from us to them. Right? Both are true. We are the wave that is the local expression of the ocean. And in a way, the ocean is the um, totality. It's the combination of all of its waves, including the wave that we are. So I want to pause there for a moment and see if you know anybody would like to sort of talk about their own experience in the meditation, when they could actually drop in to that sense of simply being, which is characterized by that combination of endings and arrivings, letting go and letting in together continually. Yeah. Anybody want to comment about that? Just super briefly, if you have your hand up, I see Tomas, you have your hand up. Do you want to comment on that, Tomas? Phillips? So I've unmuted you, Tomas. Unmute. I think I have the power to unmute you. Tom, do you need to unmute Tomas as well? Tom and I are co-hosts. I, I don't yeah, think so. Host. Hi, Rick. Okay, I Tomas. think I'm unmuted. Um, you mentioned the word ecstatic, and I was in the day long on Sunday, and I had a question about um, sensual desires. And um, I grew up in a really boring family. I mean, that was kind of my experience as a kid, like when is life going to happen? So I've always treasured sensual desires. And um, it's sort of the antithesis of Buddhism in a way, which is more of a uh, mindfulness being in the present. And it's it's been a challenge for me to let go of sensual desire. So obviously I can do that in, in a sitting practice, but I wondered if you um, had any suggestions on that um, process of letting go of sensual desires. Well, this is a huge and fundamental question in general. And also it's very relevant these days when um, if, if we, you know, deal with, you know, the coronavirus and all the rest of that, often some of the things we used to get to enjoy sensually are much less available for us, including the sensual desire broadly with other people. So, Tomas, I just want to check with you. Well, actually, I'll just, I'll say a couple things and see if that makes sense, okay? So, sure. yeah. So, point one, <clears throat> to use the, the Buddha as an example, uh, kind of deep in that tradition was um, his, his early training with radical ren renunciation, enormous ascetic practices that nearly brought him to his death. And in that tradition of the time, more the Jain tradition, uh, the attitude was life totally sucks. You might as well get out of here as fast as you can, basically. Uh, and, you know, there's this, these kind of turning points in the, that the Buddha talks about in his own journey that are really kind of, I think, have a lot of teaching for all of us. One of the turning points was when he, he says, as best we gather, um, that in meditation, when he was basically had nearly starved to death, he reflected on his life as a kid, 
speaking about your own childhood there, Tomas. And, um, and if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, let me know. Thomas or Tomas? Tomas. Okay, great. Um, you know, he, he described being a kid and essentially dropping into this blissful meditative state uh, at an event, probably maybe when he was 10, who knows. Um, and he just was dropped into bliss. And he thought to himself later on as an adult, having nearly starved to death, what was wrong with that experience? That experience was wholesome. It did not harm me. It did not harm others. In fact, it was for the welfare of me and welfare of others, this concentrated, um, blissful uh, state of absorption. That form of pleasure is not a problem. He made that distinction. And then soon thereafter, he took a little food uh, from someone who offered it to him. And then with greater energy, in part by listening to the normal sensual desires for food and comfort, uh, he then moved into his enlightenment process. And so the middle way is one in which we receive everything in life. We receive the pain and we receive the pleasure and we receive the relationships that we have with other people, the relatedness that we have with other people, um, while with wisdom, holding it increasingly lightly, enjoying it as it passes through without thingifying it and selfing it and clinging to it out of the very pragmatic recognition that if we do that, we, we create friction between us and reality as it moves through us like a rope moving through our hands. That, that's a big teaching. And um, there are many useful things that in ways in which much as we're guided by fear and anger, they are teachings. They tell us things. They give us information. In much the same way, pleasure gives us information. Uh, most pleasurable experiences, most enjoyable experiences uh, feel good because they are good for us. In the moment of feeling pleasure, there's a lowering of stress reactions, for example. In the moment of enjoying the accomplishment of a task, we get motivated to accomplish tasks in the future. Right? In the moment of feeling vital and strong as we move our bodies and, and do things, you know, that's telling us something. Or maybe as a kid, like I too, my, my family just seemed, oh boy, so beige. Nothing wrong with beige, but so pick your, <laughs> pick your neutral color. And, um, you know, I just felt like something really important was missing. And that was telling me something. And now when I, you know, I'm a pretty serious goofball and uh, playful and all the rest of that, you know, that's telling us something important. So the issue is not uh, pleasure or pain per se, nor is it, uh, you know, disliking the one or liking the other. That's not a problem. That's biology. That's fine. You know, the problem, which we can observe pragmatically, not out of belief or, you know, just because, you know, the big teacher said so, but just we observe that if we get contracted or pressured or, um, thingifying in our relationship to our experiences of pleasure or pain. That's when trouble begins. Also, you know, with some wisdom, you start to realize that certain things that feel pleasurable actually are costly over time. And we start to gradually help ourselves be drawn to a higher road, a higher happiness. Uh, meanwhile, maybe we're still a work in progress. Uh, I think one of the pleasures to be particularly careful of, especially these days, is the pleasure of righteousness. <laughs> mm. I know that pleasure well. Being right, correcting the other, proving that you were right all along. Oh, man, is that a sweet pleasure. Oh, so seductive. And you know, I think it's really important to be careful about that. And then obviously there are other kinds of pleasures, you know, around eating or drinking, intoxication, um, things like that, sexuality, that, you know, are, are well understood to be problematic if we, if we take them too far. So I think that's, that, 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 would, be an, that would be an overview. Um, do, you, do you have a comment about all that, Tomas? Uh, I appreciate that, Rick. I, I know the, um, sort of the superiority that can come with spirituality of, you know, thinking that um, I'm better than, 
you know, people who are not spiritual. Um, as far as the passions go, I, your comment that was really meaningful was the middle way, because the middle way obviously is wanting one of staying within the parameters of wisdom and love, you know, in that um, ground between them, like yeah. the Sargadatta pointed out. I have um, tended to grab at things, you know, passions, mm -hmm. and they, um, I've noticed that in the, in the, it's a grasping, I've noticed that in the grasping and in the repeated grasping, they, they don't end up being as good as they once were somehow, <laughs> you know, the yeah. first time you taste it or the first time you experience it, it can be really uh, ecstatic and repeated. It's, it's an attachment, obviously. And um, I was doing some research online on, on this and I was saying, well, you know, if you feel the passions, you should meditate on a dead decaying body, <laughs> which yeah. is perhaps a more traditional historic, um, you know, practice than, than we would do today. But um, I, I thought that was pretty hilarious. Anyway, I, I appreciate your comments about the middle way. Oh, thank you. If it's okay, then I'll, I'll mute you back and I'll just okay. say one last little thing. Make it another point and then see if others have something to say about this. Okay, great. So let's see, I'm going to lower your hand. Okay, great. A um, couple things here. One is, it is really true that in the Buddhist tradition, and you find this in other traditions as well, where people find value in really helping themselves move into complete renunciation where for them it's a path that, that works for them. You know, they really, really disengage from pleasure. And in fact, they kind of train in a certain almost indifference to pain. And uh, and as one of those uh, aspects, sometimes as a method, uh, people do talk about meditating and there are these meditations that are really clear in the Buddhist tradition where you go through the parts of the body and you're trying to develop a certain uh, disenchantment with them, if not even disgust about them. Now, I think of some of those meditations, my personal hunch is they came in after the Buddha passed away. The kind of meditations that he taught don't seem to have this kind of character in which one wants to develop a certain discussed with the parts of the body, which in the patriarchal structure of, you know, Northern India 2,500 years ago could, in which there were mainly male monastics, could then fairly quickly move down a slippery slope into uh, being misogynistic about the female body, for example. And that, that's problematic. And I, th and I think it's important to not just light on that one particular procedure, if you will, or meditative way of meditating. That one meditation among a hundred others, you know, and then kind of fixate fi upon it. The other reflection I, I have, though, that is really fundamental here is to, uh, in our own life, ask ourselves what helps us to establish the most durable sense of well-being which let's say is a combination of peacefulness, contentment, and love. What, what helps? Well, one thing that certainly helps is equanimity, which is a kind of internal shock absorber between us and our experiences. So you might ask yourself, oh, what am I doing myself to develop uh, a fundamental kind of spaciousness or non-reactivity internally to what's passing through awareness. It may be unpleasant, but I don't need to get upset about it. It may be pleasant, but I don't have to get driven about it, right? There's, some, there's, a, spacious, there's a spaciousness between us and our experiences and between their hedonic tone of pleasant, unpleasant, 
relational or neutral, let's say there's a spaciousness. That's, that's really helpful. What I find, and here's where I'm gonna say something that's just from my personal experience, it's not official, right? So it could really be wrong. Um, it's that I observe that some people just, it's kind of their nature. They find that equanimity a lot through, uh, re- through a path that, that feels fairly austere. There, for them, it works. It's kind of, there's an austerity in it. There's a letting go. Uh, you can feel in them almost a kind of indifference to the pleasures and pains of life. And, and that helps them establish that equanimity. And it, they don't become numb. They're not dead inside. But there's a, just a kind of a path of austerity and renunciation that really serves them. On the one hand, I confess that I'm not sure I'm that kind of person. And for me, and in my nature, and it may well be you as, as well, Tomas, that actually the cultivation of contentment has been a major factor in the development of equanimity. An underlying mood of contentment already really helps us, I think, enjoy pleasures without grasping after them. And that might be something, Tomas, for you and others to really reflect upon. Like, what are you, how are you helping yourself in the cultivation of contentment? A sense of basic well being with no wish for the moment to be different than what it is. And also, it's interesting to explore um, uh, the sense of resting in contentment already as a kind of mood while dreaming big dreams and rocking in the free world. Right? That, that's interesting. So I, I would really encourage that exploration, that exploration of contentment. And for me, one of the <laughs> really powerful ways to, ex- to deepen that sense of contentment uh, is in this meditation, uh, this combination that we meditated on of kind of nothing, everything, right? Releasing, receiving, ending, arriving. You, when you just kind of really live right in the immediacy of the present, it's the sense of fullness in the arriving can become almost overwhelming and it can take you just in, it supports the feeling of contentment. Like, wow, already. So, contentment. Rick, there yeah. are. Yeah. Oh, there are two people who've had their hands up. Uh, great. Tim, Thanks, Tom. Tim, why? Okay, great. I'm going to unmute you, Tim. Thanks. Great. For some reason, it takes a bit, Tim, to get you unmuted. We should have like a whirling circle, you know. There we go. Hey, Rick. Hey, I'm. Uh... I'm taking your neurodonor class and it's like helped me so much. It's awesome. And I think this mm-hmm. really follows along with my practice and what I'm trying to do with this non-dual yeah. practice in terms of sustaining non-dual uh, practice over maybe like 20 to 30 minutes, like we kind of just did. And so for me, it feels like this pulsing and this openness and this yeah. expansion and it's beautiful. And, but my question is like, I've been doing a lot of glimpse practices with like Diana Winston kind of teaches. I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with yeah, I, I feel like there are only like maybe just like a minute, minute or two of this feeling. So I'm wondering if you could speak to like cultivating um, a technique where you can sustain this kind of like, like any self-talk or something like right. that, like dropping questions in or asking who am I or. Yeah. Just, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And um, these, these kind of questions are, of course, what's really useful. They're, they are heuristic, you know, who, the root of that fancy word, you know, in IT is um, midwife. They give rise to, they give birth to deepening of practice. So these are really great questions and really great inquiries. Okay. So to kind of um, clarify a few things and, and also relating to some of the questions that have come in on the chat, um, <clears throat> The quotation that we opened with, you know, wisdom tells me I'm nothing, love tells me I'm everything, between these two my life flows, is from Nisargadatta Maharaj, and he is the author, as someone asks, of I Am That. It's really a profound book of non-dual teachings. Second, that tricky phrase, non-dual, gets thrown around a lot, and uh, 
I think it's helpful to just kind of track what we're talking about when we use it. So in my view, without being pedantic about it, there are three ways in which that term gets used. One is non-dual experientially, where in our own beingness, our own stream of consciousness, it is experienced increasingly without separations or divisions within it. And so that the mind as a whole, including awareness, is experienced in a non-dual way. Okay. So awareness and its objects start blurring together, the sense of self starts dropping out, and there's more, you're simply being. Okay. Second kind of non-dual is one in which it's like objective non-duality. The first is subjective non-duality. Objective non-duality is where the boundaries between this body and the world, between me and you, start to soften. There, there starts to be a recognition that the stuff around us, you know, the, the boundary really between the edge of this cup and everything else is increasingly relative and fuzzy and soft and temporary. All right, that's the second kind. In the meditation that we did, I was combining the two. Just the natural process when we go into being and we, as I, as I was encouraging you, engage as little deliberate action as possible. You're moving more and more into kind of classic choiceless awareness. Um, and when that happens, you start resting more and more kind of as awareness while experiences are occurring. You know, okay. With, and I was really emphasizing this aspect, to try to feel what we know is true, which is that we really are somehow lived by everything. And, okay, so that's what I mean by non-dual so far, first type and second type. The third type is the most radical of all in which people start to experience a non-separation or a non-distinction between ordinary reality, the natural Big Bang universe, and something transcendental that's beyond it all. And and then people go all the way and they describe a kind of non-duality that encompasses all three in which they're you know, kind of be really beyond words, right? Uh, okay, so the question then becomes, how do we help ourselves in these ways? And for sure that the path I'm on and the path I believe in and I've seen the fruits of for other people and I've seen the fruits for me, you know, when I kind of look backwards, um, is one in which all the practices support this quality that you're talking about, Tim. They, they all support it because when we're, when we're scared and freaked out and hijacked by our reactions, forget about it, non-dual, whatever, right? It's, right, out, the it's window. out the window. Yeah, you're running, yeah, you're for, running your, for your- I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute you, Tim, just as it comes back through. There we go. When you're running for your life, you know, you, of course. So, practices of um, calming and mindfulness and, and taking appropriate action, they all support this, right? As does, to, to your specific question now, about um, glimpses. Diana's talking about, you know, to say it a little differently, you know, sudden awakening, gradual cultivation, sudden awakening, gradual cultivation. We have these glimpses of the way it is, and then we reflect on those glimpses and we're no longer in what we glimpsed right? We're thinking about it. We're using language. There's a you know, sense of me thinking about it, you know, our own perspective. And then, boom, we have another glimpse. And that's a natural process. And what actually happens more and more is you just kind of live in the glimpse, or you feel more and more lived by the glimpse. And my own view is that the ultimate uh, is where there's a kind of irreversible switch, and people are just totally there. And that's a really, that's more rare than, a, than an Olympic gold medal, I think. And still, it's possible. I'm going for it, right? I think Thich Nhat Hanh has made that switch. Uh, there are people, Ananda Mayama, uh, I think worth looking up, uh, a woman in, from India. Deepa Ma, I think, started to make that turn. Uh, people very, very realized. They're just they're on the other side of that. Uh, but meanwhile, we can have a sense of the truth of this in the immediacy of our everyday life, you know? Um, yeah, okay. Is that okay, Tim? More on that? 
Good. Thumbs up. Okay, one more. Then Tom said somebody uh, else. And then uh, I'll... Jed Olson. Great. Hi, Jed. Plus, I'm sorry I didn't get to you last week. All right. So definitely this week. Great. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So my uh, my question here is I'm, I'm kind of on the, the flip side of what Tomas was talking about. So I was having a real uh, difficult time um, just getting into this meditation because I've had a, I've had a lot of um, scary anxiety provoking issues come up in the past few days. And so, so I'm looking at it like, well, I'm not trying, I'm trying to, to, to push away um, issues in my mind and yeah. not very successfully. Um, so what, what advice or what, what can you oh, yeah. say about that? Yeah. Well, one piece of advice sometimes is just turn off the sound. <laughs> In other words, um, I deliberately from time to time <clears throat> just say, let's just go there. Let's go to the deepest end of the pool. Let's go as far out as we can, you know. And there are times myself where I don't, I don't relate to that myself let's say. So, for example, if the kind of suggestions I'm offering to seem too sort of whatever, you know, that like they don't address the immediacy of what a person is feeling, feel really free to ignore them. I'm, I'm kind of deliberately trying to offer a variety of, um, you know, practices to, just to explore different things. And I, I'm a little biased in that, in my own background, Jed, and, and for others to know too, coming up through sort of Buddhism in the West, I, I felt like my teachers often were playing too soft. <laughs> or they were, I won't say this about my teachers, but I think there can be a tendency almost to sort of condescend to participants or students to feel like, oh, they're not ready for that. And I, I think especially as you know, mindfulness practice has matured in the West, people are ready to go after it you know, in deeper ways. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll go there sometimes, fully recognizing that the subtlety, for example, of sort of staying with in the moment, like nothingness, everything, that's so hardcore. That's what an enlightened person, Nisargadatta, was teaching, right? So it's okay if it's not so available, general point. Then specific to the concerns and all, um, the root practice of all is to feel what we're feeling. Feel what we're feeling with skillfulness, with a sense of space. And if it's at all useful for you, Jed, right now, you can just kind of bring it in like, okay, like uh, it's there, I'm feeling it. But, but there's a spaciousness and you're kind of rested in the spaciousness in which the feelings are happening. And then there's a letting them flow. Uh, part of the root practice as well is to bring warmth to ourselves, to rest in a warmth, um, you know, a lovingness, uh, compassion for ourselves, really, really fundamental, right? And then I think, you know, there's something very deep about establishing that in the midst of all this, will I still be okay in the core of my being? You know, as I, as I define okayness, minimally, am I still gonna be alive? Am I gonna live through the next breath? Yes, right? Um, is the goodness in me intact? Yes. Are, is my sincerity intact? Yes. Is my commitment to repair when I can intact? Yes. You know, is all the good that I've ever done will have always been the case? Yes. You know, you just kind of go through it, or maybe non-verbally perhaps, you know. Do am I still loved by at least some people? Do is my capacity to love itself intact? Yes, this is very important. And for me, there's a humility in the practice I'm just walking us through of like sort of reassurance, 
reassurance is really important. You know, we're soft, scared, vulnerable, frail animals. Just so vulnerable to being wiped out by something in the next minute. Of course, we're scared. So, you know, reassurance is really important. Um, still okay. So I would just offer that. Do you want to respond, Jed, to what I've said so far? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's helpful. Um, it's just, I guess sitting in the meditation and, and trying to, to drop into that um, place where I felt I could allow things just to be, um, I don't know, it was, it was difficult. Uh, uh, I, I was fighting internally and, and every once in a while I would get a good um, breath single breath of meditation. Can I ask you, Jed, what were you fighting with? Uh, I, I've had some medical issues and it yeah. seems like um, new symptoms keep popping up and piling on top of one another. And uh, Yeah, so not to pry, you know, but more just, was it that there was like a resisting of the anxiety? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, well, I, I really wish you well. I'm sure others are too right now. And um, the question, of course, is what would happen if we just, you know, really let it be? You know, there, there is fear. I mean, some methods that are quite useful are to simply name it, you know, name it. Mm -hmm. Oh, fear. Oh, you know, of course I'm scared. And a sense of common humanity is also really helpful, you know. So uh, there's that part. Um, and then there's also can be helpful in the, in the feeling of it uh, to really just allow a natural freaked outness, you know, like the, the animal, the body doesn't want to go. <laughs> I feel that way, you know, I'm... I get a mole check every three, three months, you know, and I get scared going in. It's there, right? It's okay. It's natural. Uh, I have a friend who got a very scary medical diagnosis uh, of an aggressive cancer, and I'm really, my heart's heavy for him, mm. knowing what he's going through. These are very natural feelings, really natural feelings. So we can let ourselves feel them, but we can also, and we can also recognize is there a place inside that has just a fundamental, genuine serenity underneath it all? You know, so, so I guess so for me, it's, if you could think of it almost procedurally, is to really let ourselves feel it fully. And if it's continuing to knock on our door, we probably haven't felt it fully yet. Mm. Feel it fully with spaciousness and care and acceptance to really own the naturalness of the mortal, the mortal flesh and the reactions of the mortal flesh to really, to really own them, you know? Yeah. And there are ways in which often there are cultural inhibitions against or prohibitions against actually owning how it's landing to be this scared or to be this heavy hearted, you know? To just a, it's natural, of course. This is what bodies do, of course. It's like you want to take the next breath. There's this true story of a, uh, told by a very senior Zen practitioner, I, I don't remember his name, it was a man who had a very, very, very well-known uh, Zen teacher from Japan, a fairly small old man. And the person who's telling the story reported going in for his interview with his Zen teacher and the person who was reporting like, oh, I really realized that impermanence is everywhere and we're all going to die. Every thought is empty. And I'm just experiencing so much inner peace about that. And then basically the, and with great drama, the Zen master, the Roshi, le leaped off his chair cushion and started strangling the huge burly male student, you know, who was telling his story. <laughs> and and the, the guy who's telling the story says, man, he was strong. <laughs> you know, his wiry fingers, I could 
barely pry them off my neck, you know? And, and like, this is my Zen teacher is like trying to strangle me, right? And finally gets him off and, you know, the, you know, the Zen teacher smiles at him and says, so what about that non-attachment? <laughs> 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 it's natural, okay? And, and also, as we're called again and again, what is also true? What is more deeply true? You know, all patternings of reality disperse eventually, while reality itself endures, right? Um, certainly in this life, all experiences disperse eventually, like as eddies in the stream, while the awareness they move through endures, the beingness endures, which may well partake of something transpersonal. Right? That's the deeper level. And we can find this kind of place inside that seems so almost uncanny. It seems to me transpersonal. It, or it doesn't have a sense of um, rickness to it. it. It's just like this deep, 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 deep inner peace, serenity, okayness. Like, thank you for the incredible ride I've had already. <laughs> You know, in a life, in my case, it's had a, a lot of unhappiness in it, particularly when I was younger. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm privileged and fortunate in a zillion ways, you know, and, right, uh, I think people in general can report being in touch with the sense inside, even no matter what, like, wow, amazing already, wow. You know, with, with maybe a fundamental serenity. So to me, those are the kind of primary practices. Feel it fully. And if, you're, if it's still banging on your door, maybe there's a deeper layer to feeling it. Recognize our common humanity, our fleshy common humanity. And can we find an underlying quiet and stillness underneath it all? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I really wish you well with this, Chad. Yeah. Okay, well, it is that time. I want to see if there are, I know we have a couple more minutes. There was uh, Howard who had a question. Where are you, Howard? So we're going to do, get to Howard? Are you, can, and this will be the last one and I'll be quick. All right, Howard, sorry. Where are you, Howard? Oh, there you are. Yay, I beg your pardon. You're in the very first one, right under my nose, of course, you know. All right, I'm unmuting you repeatedly. There we go. All right, Howard. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm honored to be chosen. I did your workshop in Toronto. Oh, good. Um, the one day, the first day. Yeah. Um, yeah, workplace. Workplace crisis going on where people are, factions are at each other. And it's like, feels like even now while we're doing this session, I feel, oh, another email came in. There's another need to respond. Yeah. And much is at stake. Uh, as far as the eddies go, they may want, they may one day look small, but now they feel large where uh, heads could roll, where factions are at each other, where there's much non-goodwill. Yeah. And I'm, I found myself within this situation in a way unjustly, which is part of the, the, the test. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really, you know, kind of, it's a huge challenge. And, but your last uh, questioner was feeling similar things, which is how to navigate through a crisis of fear and attack, whether that attack is coming from within or from without. Yeah. That, does that add up to a question of yeah. how to find and come back to myself through a very challenging time? Could go on for months, could go on for weeks, could go on for a year. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll just kind of mention briskly some things that I have found for myself about that kind of thing. One is to, uh, just as I was saying previously, to really feel it fully and to uh, include, if it's appropriate, a recognition of what you're dealing with, with really clear eyes. Uh, you know, for myself, uh, there have been situations where I would just have to say to myself, wow, I did not see that coming. No. I had no idea that person was capable of that or thought so little of me, actually. Wow. Or was just so kind of 
casually shitty in a certain way, like, whoa. <laughs> and, you know, and sometimes I think we're so afraid of being righteous and judgmental and so forth, where we tilt too far the other way and we don't kind of claim a certain discernment, like, oh, you know, so I think that's sometimes part of it. Second, uh, the crazier it gets outside, the calmer we need to get inside. You know, the, the more we're mistreated from the outside, the more we treat our, need to treat ourselves well on the inside. And so often what's helpful is to come back to basic practices, to, to, to tighten up a little bit. Maybe we've gotten a little sloppy, we had our momentum carry us, and, but now, whoa, I need to meditate more diligently, I need to make my bed, I need to make sure I'm you know, eating reasonably well, and, and to do those things we can actually do, you know, get back on the treadmill, whatever, you know, exercise, just, just kind of tighten up our own cabin, our own side of the street, ship shape. I, that's helpful, because that's something we can do. Another thing is to really accept the limits of our influence, and wow. to just realize, wow, there's so much here I can't fix, I can't change. And if you're, I just have this intuition about you, you know, like me, maybe uh, perhaps that uh, you're someone who is good at helping and fixing and improving and influencing. Great, I'm seeing the nod. And maybe rewarded for that or a job for that. And I think there are a lot of people who are like that. And to just really appre appreciate the fact of the matter, which is outnumbered, outgunned, so much here I can't do anything about. The one piece I can do something about is this, and I'm going to do this, and that's all I can do. I think there's a there's a peacefulness in, in that, you know, it's the serenity prayer essentially, right there. The, those things. I, I know that's key. And what about when you have to fight? What about when you need to? Yep. Uh, you know, like what do you call it? Um, uh, Skillful defend. assertiveness. Yes. Well, defend Courage. yourself yeah. and have yeah. to do it. Actively, I don't mean only in writing, but you know, yeah. um, uh, if you're being attacked or your reputation, yeah. and how does a person from the Buddhist perspective uh, yeah. deal with co real conflict um, in a true sense of uh, without being overly righteous, but just being, you know, yeah. if you're so so called the nice guy, and suddenly, oh, yeah. oh no, wait, you you could go down if you do not take a firm stand? This is a huge question and one that's very timely these days, okay. obviously. Yes, and, these days, and, and it is related to these days. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, well, I'm gonna definitely finish quickly here. Fear not, those of you, you might wanna leave in a second. Uh, well, the Buddha, just to go there for a moment, he definitely stood up for himself. You know, in his time, there was sort of like Dharma combat. People would come to him and they would be very contemptuous. They would be very challenging. They would come to him and, you know, with all their superiority and, or they would tell him about some kind of practice they were doing and he, he would confront them and he would definitely uh, call out uh, people within the community uh, for uh, violations of different kinds. And one of the, admirable attributes so in the in this tradition is that we are someone is admonishable now admonishment needs to come skillfully but to to be someone who can actually hear correction or an input and take it on board and including a critique even a moral critique and to, and to receive it and implement it and, and move forward so it, it it's a two-way street it goes the other way as well um, i think myself of uh, the ways in which if we uh, let wrongdoing occur, including toward ourselves. In some ways we enable it. And there's a place where we decide to say, no, for the sake of the tribe as a whole, I'm gonna stand up for justice, even if it costs me in some ways, maybe we make that choice. Also, uh, if we would protect another person who was mistreated, is it not appropriate to protect ourselves if the same thing has happened to us? There's that. Uh, then in terms of how we communicate about it, I, I needed to deal with a thing like this myself in my professional world over the last year or so. And I think it's really helpful to imagine that whatever you write or say is going to be played or uh, restated at your memorial service or your kid's wedding. 
<laughs> or something, or it's going to be, you know, on like national television. So to really think about, you know, what you're writing, what you're saying, you know, will test the test of time. And for me, the greatest weight is to maintain your dignity and to communicate in, with clarity about what the facts are and what the relevant values are. And in simple language that strips out righteous topspin or uh, fault finding, uh, I think coming in diffidently is the, you know, sometimes the best way, like you're just still trying to gather information. It preserves your most options. But, it, but you know, if you think of the moral weight of like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, or the teachings of Gandhi in the face of oppression, you know, and other kinds, they, there's, there, there's a way to do both, to bring the, the moral weight of, of truth telling and naming what it is. Um, without tipping, we can feel it, without tipping into a kind of punishing, righteous fault finding. Uh, I better leave it there, okay? It's very and, kind of you, thank you. Oh, no, well, and good luck. <laughs> Trying to make it a better world. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you all for hanging in here with this. I know I've gone long and it's, I won't normally go long. And I promise you, next week, I will talk about stuff that's super down to earth.